Okay, Alison, we are ready. So, you're recording? All right, welcome everybody to today's webinar, Working and Maintaining Our uh, Social Security Benefit with Andy Hardwick and Alison Chabert. And uh, first I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Veronica Alvarez for the, the people that no, don't know me. And I'm the Regional Talking Coordinator for Partners Resource Network. I will talk to you guys about what we do, what we are. And then after that, we are going to uh, start our presentation. Thank you for joining in today. So Partners Resource Network, we are the Parent Training and Information Centers for Texas. We are funded by the Department of Education, Office of Special Education, and we provide free resources for parents of children with disabilities and young adults with disabilities or self-advocates. Our mission is um, that all parents of children with disabilities will have this universal access to information training and support and advocacy skills to ensure that children achieve their fullest potential. And uh, while leading the community on the rights of all children. So that's what we, our mission, our vision are. And we serve parents of children with disabilities and youth with disabilities from the ages from zero to 26 years. Partner Research Network was funded in 1986, and we have four projects serving parents in Texas. Myself, I'm part of the team project that you can see there in the, in the red area. So team project, we serve families in region 13, that's, that's me, and then in region 20, we have another coordinator, Miguel Diaz, and region one in the valley, we have Maria Cordero. Our services are free and we offer parent workshops, youth workshops, webinar like this one's information and referral, one-on-one -on -one technical assistant, art and IEP support, one, once a year symposium, parent leadership training, youth leadership training, access to social media and resources. So uh, some housekeeping items, if you have any question, please use the chat box and we will answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so you are muted and, and you, don't have access, you, you don't have access to the camera. And this webinar will be recorded and we are going to share this presentation in our project's Facebook pages and soon as, as soon as we have the, the recording. Also, Allison is going to tell you guys she also has a YouTube channel when, where she posts all, all these videos. And at the end of the presentation, automatically you are going to receive an email with a survey and evaluation for today's presentation. Please fill it out and provide us with honest feedback. That's how we report to our grant. How are we doing? We do not provide CEUs for this class or for this webinar. We only give you guys certificate of attendance. If you need one, please just send me an email or put it in a chat box that you need one and I can give you one with all the email with the slides and um, some information that we have for you. This is my information, my contact information, and also it's in the chat box, my phone number, my email, and our main web page. So now I'm going to share a uh, new screen. I'm going to stop this one. Oh, 
If you want, I can go ahead and share mine. Okay, can you see that okay? Okay, perfect. Um, so Allison Scalberg here, Consolidated Planning Group. We're excited uh, to be here with you today. If, you, if this is your first time, welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, we're excited to partner um, with Veronica again. We've done uh, several presentations uh, with them over the last um, several months, so we're glad to be back. Allison Scobber, Consolidated Planning Group, and we're really a holistic special needs financial planning firm. We really pride ourselves on putting out a lot of educational events for families to be able to navigate some of these difficult topics um, on their own. So today, we're super, super excited to have Andy Hardwick with us from the Social Security Administration. Andy's a bit of a legend, and um, so we're really, we, yeah, it's true, he is a legend. So he uh, eats, sleeps, and breathes this today, and there's so much confusion and so much, um, there's so many questions. Even if you've studied it a lot, you've looked at it a lot, there's always 10 more questions when it comes to SSI and Medicaid and working and what can we do and what we can't do. So um, Andy's gonna take a deep dive with us on that today. Uh, this is going to be recorded and we are gonna put the uh, recording out. You guys are gonna get an email link with the recording. We'll also have our YouTube channel so you guys can subscribe to that YouTube channel and hear other recordings uh, like this. And if you, uh, again, we'll put your questions in the chat box. We're gonna wa watch that chat box today and we're gonna get to as many as we possibly can. We do have a hard stop today uh, at one o'clock. So we're planning on getting through this and um, getting to as many questions as we can within the time frame. So thanks so much for, for being here. And Andy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much. My name is Andy Hardwick. I'm a public affairs specialist for social, social security. I am outstationed at the Houston Southwest office, which services all of Southwest Houston and Fort Bend County. If you have any issues that require contact with Social Security, please do so by phone or via the internet. Uh, right now, the Social Security offices nationwide are closed for most business, except for dire need cases. Uh, if you feel that you have a dire need case that warrants a face-to-face -face interview, you're welcome to contact your local office, explain what the dire need is, if you meet the criteria, we will set up an appointment for you to come to the office. If you come to the office without an appointment, just show up. Uh, the doors are closed. You will not be admitted. Okay. But my advice to you is try the internet, socialsecurity.gov or ssa.gov. A lot of information is available there, and you can do a lot of things online that formerly required you to contact Social Security or actually present yourself at the Social Security office. <clears throat> also, if for some reason you have a difficulty in um, filing a, perhaps for a child with disabilities, filing a claim online and you get a pop-up that tells you you can't proceed any further or you're not able to do that, uh, please call the local office we will arrange for a phone appointment and we will take all the data by phone and then later on send that for your signature and we'll take care of it. So uh, I don't know when offices are gonna open back up again. So for the time being, just remember either online or by phone. Now, uh, you may have the 1-800 number 772-1213. That's our national hotline. Uh, that's open from 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., 1-800-772-1213. However, the waiting times can be long. If you go to socialsecurity.gov or ssa.gov and click on office locator, I'm sorry, click on contact us down below on the homepage, and then type in office locator, you'll put in the office zip code, you'll put in your zip code, pardon me, and then it will give you the phone number and the fax number of your local social security office. The wait times on that are much shorter than calling the 1-800 number. Okay, next slide, please. 
So today we're going to talk about work incentives. What are work incentives? They're employment support provisions that help beneficiaries move from benefit dependency to independence. What does that mean? That sounds like a lot of government uh, doublespeak. Like, what are they talking about? In other words, once you've gotten your child on SSI, okay, maybe in school they're in some kind of program where they're urging them to go to work, all right? And you're thinking to yourself, well, I just got my child on SSI and he has Medicaid. Now, if they go to work, they're going to lose their Medicaid and SSI, and not necessarily, okay? The goal of the work incentive programs, whether you get, whether your child gets SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSI, Supplemental Security Income, okay, is to see what the capability of your child is. It, can we make that child completely independent? Is there a point, maybe sometime in the near future, where they might not depend on SSI or SSDI, and they could just be working like everybody else to have health insurance through an employer. Okay, that's not a realistic goal for everyone, but we want, we want young people to try it. We wanna see what they're capable of. And while they're in the process of getting their feet wet and trying to work, they can still keep their SSI or SSDI or both and keep their Medicaid and Medicare, okay? So, so these programs are to encourage young people and their caregivers to give it a try, to give work a try. Now, maybe they won't be able to work full-time, and that's fine. At least the extra income they earn will be able to supplement either their SSI or SSDI. Next slide. So before we go into the work incentives, we're going to talk a little bit about the basics. What are the disability programs? How do we define disability? And what is substantial gainful activity? Next slide. All right. In order to receive Social Security or SSI based on disability, you have to have a physical or, or mental condition that's gonna keep you out of work for at least 12 months, may or may not result in death, <clears throat> and you are unable to engage in substantial gainful activity. And we're gonna define that in a minute, what substantial gainful activity is. But <clears throat> it basically means that your child is unable to do uh, the amount of work or earn the amount of money that somebody that doesn't have a disability would be earning, okay, in working in the same job. So we're so that's so first before your child can receive SSI or SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, they have to have a physical or mental disability that has to be approved by us. What we use for our for criteria to determine whether or not a person is disabled is something called a manual called disability evaluation under social security, but the nickname is Blue Book. If you go to ssa.gov or socialsecurity.gov and on the top of the home page, you click on search and type in Blue Book, blue like the color blue, Blue Book, you will see the manual that social security uses to determine whether or not a person is disabled. We do not make the disability decision in the local social security office. An agency of the state called DDS, Disability Determination Services. They get the medical portion of the claim and they get in contact with doctors, hospitals, clinics, schools, and they look at the manual and they'll see, they'll, in order to see if the person meets the standards that are found in that disability manual. Next slide. Okay, so one of the, once your child starts working, okay, <clears throat> uh, there are, with, with the SSI program, basically, we don't count the first $20 of any income they might have. And then if the income is from work, we don't count another $65. So in, in it, in the case of a child or a young person that was working and had no other income other than the SSI, 
and work income, we would take $85 from the gross monthly income. And then after that, we would, we would divide by whatever's left by two, and then that's what we would count against the SSI. So let's see, for instance, uh, someone that's earning $1,200 a month gross, okay? Um, uh, we, would, we would not count the first $85, so that would leave 1135 and then we would divide that by two and whatever whatever the whatever is left it would be subtracted from the ssi and and that's what we would count now suppose this same person though is um is earning 1200 dollars a month but they have a uh, they need certain medication to enable them to work because of their physical or mental condition they can't be without this medication. This is what helps them work. The medication costs $75 a month. So that would be if you presented that to Social Security and you said, this is an impairment related work expense. In other words, this is uh, an expense that I have and this enables me to work. So that means the $75 that your child spends for medication would not be counted, would be subtracted from the 1200 gross he or she made so that means we would we would only start counting 1125 dollars of their of their income and then from that from that we would subtract 85 and then we would divide by by two and whatever's left that's what would be countable but let's say impairment related work expense they had like um let's say to need to to get to work there was no public transportation the only way they could get to work was by taxi or by Uber. And that's basically, um, let's say that were $400 a month. Okay, if you come to Social Security and we accept that, yes, that, then that means that of the 1200, let's say your child were earning $1,200 a month and we approved the $400 a month for transportation costs, we would subtract that from 1200. So instead of starting out counting 1200 and subtracting 85, we would subtract 400 from the 1200. That means 80, $800. From that figure, we would subtract 85 and then divide that by half. So uh, whatever kind of work expense a person has, if Social Security, if Social, if Social Security approves that, that this is an expense that the person has to enable them to work, that means we could subtract that from their gross wages. That means that much less, we would be counting that much less of their gross wages. Okay, next slide. Please. Andy, could you give um, just a few more examples of, um, of some impairment related expenses, if it was maybe an iPad or some type of software that enables them to perform or, are they, can you just give a few other examples okay. of this? Okay, well, yeah. Um, let's say they had an iPad or they had uh, something else that, that came out to be, well, here, here we go right here in the slides, transportation costs, attended care services, service animals, medical devices, prosthesis, residential modification, prescription drugs, and other items like assistive technology. So if, if there was a special wheelchair that they needed for work that they needed to rent out, and let's say they were earning $1,200 a month, but the cost of the wheelchair were $500 a month, that 500 would be subtracted from the 1200. So that means instead of starting out counting 1200 and subtracting 85 from that, we would take, we would subtract 500 from the 1200, that, that would leave 700. So 700 is what we're gonna be counting of the wages. We'd say take 85 from that, that's 635 and divide that by two. So we would count that much less of their income because uh, they have a certain expense related to, um, to the, in other words, that enables them to work. If they had a service animal, uh, whatever kind of expenses uh, were connected with that service animal, uh, if that's what enabled them to perform their work activity or go to work, uh, we could also subtract any expenses uh, associated with having a, a service animal, training for that animal, um, food for the animal, things like that. So all that, all that could be um, could be deducted from the gross wages. Meaning we would count that much less of the gross wages, which means that 
the SSI check would be affected less. Uh, medical devices, wheelchairs, dialysis equipment, pa pacemakers, respirators, uh, traction equipment, braces, anything like that. So anything like that could also be, um, you know, if the, now it has to be approved by Social Security. You can't just say, well, we have this expense and uh, you're not going to count. You have to come to Social Security and explain why this is a necessary expense. And then if we approve it, that means that whatever that expense is, that means we're going to subtract that from the gross wages. That means we're going to count that much less of the gross wages that a person earns in the so month. So in COVID times, in this example, so I imagine that there's somebody on here that maybe have some of these expenses but didn't know this was a thing and they haven't reported this before. So this is where you call your local social security office, schedule an appointment, have your information together. You want receipts, you want proof of all of this. You can say whatever you want, but you need proof. Right. And, and, and basically that person that you talk to at the social security administration will provide a fax number or a way for you to submit the documentation. Is that how it works? Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yes. Perfect. You, yeah. You'll have to document it because like I said, uh, just, the allegation is not enough. We'll have to see something. We'll have to see receipts and things to see what the actual expenses are. We'll, we'll look at them. And if, if it's approved, then that means that much less of your child's income is being counted because this is a, so this is one of the work incentive programs we have. We have uh, meaning that, that we're not going to be counting all of the wages if they're working, if they have these expenses, these will be subtracted. So that means we will be counting that much less of the wages. I okay? have two quick questions and I know we got to move on. Um, how, how often are we um, approving like such thing as an iPhone? Um, a person with a disability needs a phone. So how often are we approving something like that? And the other question I had is what about um, somebody who needs counseling service because they're so anxious, they have to have intensive counseling to be able to work with counseling. And oftentimes counseling services are not covered by regular insurance or other things like that. It's a lot of out of pocket. Would something like that be a disability and impairment related expense if there was an underlying diagnosis? The counseling service, I think, would have a chance of approval. As far as the iPhone goes, they would have to prove that the iPhone is something that, 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 that they need to, in other words, if they didn't have it, they wouldn't be able to work. Okay. My son is visually impaired and he needs the iPhone for transportation to go to oh. one location to another one oh, and okay. voiceover and stuff like that. Okay. It's just the phone or it's also the, the monthly payments of the, the phone bill, you know, with the internet and stuff. Can you well, talk about uh, that? Uh, the cost of the phone, I don't know about I don't know the calls and everything. If it was associated with him or her going to work, then yes. But if it's associated with other things, no. Uh, now, as far as blind work expenses, we have for people that are visually impaired, um, they have a lot more leeway. There's more of their income that we don't count. Uh, I don't know why, but it's just a, it's a separate category. So if a person has if a person has been approved because they were visually impaired and that's the main uh, diagnosis, then there are there are other things that we could also um, uh, not count. Okay. Now, uh, as you see from this slide, we have the form 821, the work activity report. So this is what a person should use, and you can download this from the from our website. Uh, and this will this will show uh, certain things like uh, let's say uh, let's say um, if they work regular irregular hours or they're given special equipment because of their of, of their condition or did they get extra help. So these are all that we want you to put this down because then we might have to they they might be some things like some hints to us that maybe we should recontact you and develop this because that means maybe we can count even less of your child's income while he or she is working. So this 821 work activity report, this is for you to fill out and let us know. So please please let us uh, make sure that when your child goes to work, you notify Social Security. Don't wait a few months because in some cases, 
like in the SSI program, it could result in an overpayment, an erroneous payment where later they, they end up owing us money. So you wanna be in contact with social security. You also wanna go to our website. And if Spanish is your primary language, you can, you can just put segurosocial.gov de Victor and everything will come out in Spanish. So you, you'll get all the instructions and everything in Spanish. So make sure that you check with the website. That's where you get the most accurate information. I even tell people when I speak or you talk to somebody at Social Security, always check with the website to make sure that maybe you heard right or maybe, you know, maybe after you heard it, you didn't write it down. So was that, did they say that or did they say, always go to the website and check the information and there you will find the most accurate information. Okay, so let's talk about, let's talk about uh, employment uh, supports or work incentives that we have for the SSI program. So if your child gets SSI, the check that comes on the first of the month and provides Medicaid, we have earned income exclusion, student earned income exclusion, uh, special SSI payments for people who work, and Medicaid while working. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. We have more, by the way, but we're just going to go into some of these. Okay, next slide. So earned income exclusion. As I told you before, if your child um, has no other income other than the wages and, and the SSI, we don't count the first $65 of their gross monthly income. Now, if they have no, no income at all, uh, other than the wages and the SSI, we actually don't count the first $85 of that income. And then whatever is left is divided by two, and then that's what we count against the SSI. That's assuming they don't have any uh, work incentive exclusions, because if they have impairment-related work expenses or other exclusions, then after we subtract the 85 and divide by half, we're going we're gonna to use other exclusions. So we're gonna count that much less of their income. Okay, next slide. Okay, if your child is under 22 and receiving SSI and working, okay, they can actually earn up to $1,900 per month, up to a maximum of 7,670. Now this is for 20, for 2020, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize this was a year behind. So it's a little bit more this year, but basically that's about it. Basically, uh, they can earn up to about $1,900 a month without us counting anything. This is as long as they're under 22 and working. Okay, once I they're 22 the numbers, or above, it's different. I think the number is 1930 for 2021. Okay, 1930. Okay, thank you. Um, and for 2020 it was 7670. I can't remember what it is for 2021, slightly higher, okay? But uh, so if your child earns that 1930, once they reach the 7,670, then this thing goes away. Even if they're under 22, then we just apply the regular minus 65 or if no other income, minus 85, and then divide by two and whatever is left, that's what we don't count. But if they're under 22 and working, you can see this is very generous. They can be earning up to $1,900 a month before we start counting anything of their other income. Now, they have to be regularly attending school, which means if they're in a college or university, at least eight hours a week, grades seven to 12, at least 12 hours a week, or in a training course to prepare for employment, at least 12 hours a week, okay? So, so it, it, they can't just be, we don't apply this exclusion to them if they're not a student. Okay, so you got to be careful with that. Okay, next slide. Okay, so if a person has been eligible for SSI and um, but now due to their income, which I think would have to be like over 1693, basically over 1693 before their SSI went down to zero. We, we still might be able to give them, uh, we wouldn't give them SSI, but well, technically they would be on SSI, but they would still have the Medicaid coverage, okay? So um, they're even earning as much as 
$400 a week, basically gross, they could still stay on the SSI program. They would not see a, an SSI check, but they would still be on the Medicaid program. So if tomorrow they got laid off, then their checks would start up again. Or if their work were cut in half, then they might be able to get their checks again. So um, just because we stop the checks doesn't mean they stop being on SSI or they stop uh, having Medicaid coverage. Okay. I want you to repeat that again, because I think there's a lot of confusion um, on SSI and working. So we do have a question. We have several questions and I'm, okay. I'm paying attention to them, but I know that your slides are going to cover a lot of them. So I'm going to kind of wait um, okay. towards the end for, for some of them. But I think that there's where there's confusion. So there's SSI and Medicaid, and then we've got SSDI, Social Security Disability. Basically, if a parent is um, retired or disabled, and we sometimes have concurrent enrollment. So there can be some confusion on this. So right now, I just want to be clear that we're really talking about SSI. We're talking about yeah. working and being on SSI. So if your loved one is a concurrent enrollee, there are a whole different set of rules and we'll get to some of them. But I, yeah. I just wanna be clear that there's some changes if, you, if you're if you duly qualified. So I, I, right. I just wanted to mention that. That's right, you, you are, we have something called the red book. Remember I told you about the blue book. If you go to socialsecurity.gov or ssa.gov, you can type in the search up above, uh, type in a red book, like the color red, okay? That has the work programs for SSI and SSDI. Now, some of the, some, uh, uh, some of the work incentives uh, are for both programs, but some are exclusively to SSI, some are exclusively to SSDI. And believe me, in an hour, it's very confusing. Okay, I don't expect you to understand this, but download the red book. Okay, have it there as, or, or just refer to it online and have it there as a resource. It's a good book to have as a resource. Then if you have some confusion, you, uh, you're welcome to email me and I'll try to help you out. I also have a colleague of mine who is, uh, who specializes in this, who can, if I can't answer your question, I will refer it to him and he will get an answer for me and I will get it to you, okay? But really, uh, the way to work, it, work with this, you're not gonna be contacting me. You're gonna contact me if you have a question, but to report the wages, you're gonna do the wage report to your local social security office. And that's where you're gonna report all those changes. I just can help you uh, by answering some of your questions, but I'm not, I don't take, I don't, uh, I'm not a, I'm not a, a customer service representative or I'm not a claims representative, a claim specialist. So I don't do that anymore. My job description is different. So, so I can, I'll just refer you to the local office, but I can try to answer your questions. Um, All right. one, one other thing, Andy, we did have something in the chat box. So basically when it comes to applying for SSI Medicaid, we have other webinars um, about that um, out there. So you can definitely listen to that. But when your child turns 18, it's based off of their assets, not yours. Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, they may have not qualified before, but they will possibly when they turn 18. Yeah. What happens is, look, the, the, the earliest you can apply for SSI on behalf of your child, unless you have limited wages and, and resources, would be when they turn 18. Even though technically the application is effective the following month because they were not 18 the month, the month they turned 18, okay? They were not 18 for the whole month, all right? So the, the application becomes effective the following month, but you can start the application the month they turn 18. OK, that means that beginning age 18, the, f the first full month that they're age 18, which will be the following the month after you apply, we're not going to be counting parents income or assets at all. OK, just what the child has. But somebody asked the question in the chat box, what about two or three months before? No, because if you do that, for instance, if your child is going to be um, 18 in June and uh, you apply, let's say, in, in April or May, it's, the, the, the claim will be denied because we're still going to be counting parental income and resources, okay? But if you count 
And, and for instance, if you apply in May and their birthday is in June, the problem is that the application will be effective June 1st. Well, unless they were born June 1st, they were not 18 the full, the full month of June, which means they're gonna be denied, okay? So June, if that's when they turn 18, you're gonna apply, but the application is actually effective July 1st. By July 1st, they will be 18 the whole month. Nothing of the parents will count. So <clears throat> even, though, even though the month you're applying is, uh, uh, they're still counting parents' income and assets. Technically, that, since that application is affected the following month, it's okay. You don't have to worry about, well, that month, that means my, my child won't be able to. Yeah, they want the month of applying, but the date of the application will be the first of the following month. So that's the first month that they're 18, the whole month, and mom and dad's income won't count. So you can, you, the earliest you should apply is the month they turn 18. And okay. Andy, um, um, we recommend our families. So to the person's point of, can I apply early? So the answer is no, you can't. It's the month that they turn 18. But what you can do is call early two months in advance and schedule your appointment for the month that they turn 18 because um, the social security offices are busy. They're working from home, as Andy mentioned. And so you may not want to wait to call till the month to get the appointment because it's possible it could be eight or 10 weeks before you actually get an appointment. So we do recommend calling early and getting it for that month. And, and, and of course, you can go online and do it. Some, um, some people really prefer, prefer to talk to a live person and they feel better about the whole process as opposed to being online. So that's up to you, but we do recommend that. And, and, and also, when you do apply, Andy, isn't it true that basically when you first start with a, a local social security office, that's basically where you, the office that you work with going forward? Right. Uh, the, uh, the way it is, your local office is the, the office that services your zip code. Again, if you want to know which is your local office, go to ssa.gov or socialsecurity.gov. And down below where it says contact us, click on that. And then, uh, in, then scroll down to where it says office locator, put in your zip code, and you'll get the fax number and the phone number of your local social security office. They'll be handling your case. Okay. Now, uh, Allison, great advice about telling people that they can call a month or two early uh, to schedule the appointment for the month the child turns 18. That's great because we are, you know, things are a little bit slower since most of our employees are working from home, but we have access to all the electronic systems. But that is a great idea is people should call in and, uh, and make that appointment for the month the child turns 18. Okay, now uh, 1619B, another program we have where a person, uh, your child could be making $24,000 a year. As long as they still need the Medicaid, they, we place them on what's called 1619B. They're still on SSI. Now they have to keep all the rules. Just because they're not getting an SSI check doesn't mean that you can say, oh, whoopee now. Now they can have as much money as they want in the bank, as many cars as they have and everything because they're not on SSI. No, as long as they're on Medicaid, they're still on SSI technically because tomorrow if they lose that job, then they'll be eligible for a cash payment from SSI again because as I said, they don't come off of SSI because if they lose their SSI completely, then that means they would lose the Medicaid also. But, and but as long as they, as long as they clarify, I need the Medicaid because whatever insurance I have through my employer, if I have any, doesn't cover all my needs, all my medical needs. So I need the Medicaid. In that case, we place them on the 1619B and that means they're still on SSI, not getting a check, but they are on under Medicaid. And so just a quick snapshot for those of you that are thinking of applying or in just in the quick, fast and in a hurry. Basically, if you're single, it's $2,000 assets, one house, one car. If you're married, it's $3,000 assets, basically one house, one car. Those are your basic qualifications. So if you have more money than that, than that outside of an ABLE account or a special needs trust, 
right off the bat before you ever even apply, you basically don't qualify even if you do have that disability. So it, it's important to understand that, that SSI is a means-based program and, and those are basically the, the premise of starting off, off right off the bat, even if a person is truly, truly disabled. Okay, all right, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Okay. If, if for some reason your child loses SSI and something changes within 12 months, we can, they don't need to start a new application. If they went into a non-payment status and, but something changed within 12 months, we don't need to, we just need to do a review of the case and we'll get them back on. But if it's been over 12 months that your child is in non-payment status, unless they're on 1619B or 1619A, then, uh, then you need to file a new application. Okay, but we'll let you know. We'll, we'll, we'll let you know. But, and when right. people have a child that is already on some type of, you know, already on SSI or Medicaid, they've already got something, and then the child turns 18, and this is where they don't need to reapply, but it's a review. What yes, needs to we'll happen do a, at that point? Okay. When a child is under 18, in that blue book, that disability evaluation under Social Security, uh, at, at the, the um, DDS, the Disability Determination Services, uses certain criteria to decide whether or not a child is disabled. Once they turn 18, now their DDS is going to be using the adult criteria. So they're going to do a medical redetermination. So uh, the parent is going to get some questions, like a questionnaire about what doctors has the child been seeing in hospitals and maybe uh, ask for school reports and things like that. Make sure that's filled out in order for that child to continue on SSI. Because in order for them to continue on SSI, they have to be considered disabled according to adult standards. Okay, next slide. Okay, so there's a special rule to help people who, who work and receive supplemental security based on blindness. This person enables, or the, I'm sorry, this rule enables a person to exclude from earned income all the expenses that enable a person uh, to work, okay? All right, next one. So if a person starts going to work, a child, as I said before, make sure you notify us about the, their work activity, okay? Don't wait a few months because what's gonna happen is it's gonna result probably in an overpayment and then we'll have to reduce the checks to recover the, the erroneous money that that was paid out. So don't do that. Okay, please. All right, next slide. Um, on reporting, so basically um, it's our responsibility if they're going to work to report that they've gone to work and the deal of where they're working and all that kind of stuff. But then there is also a reporting component, like a monthly reporting component of earnings. Is that correct? Yes, y yes. You can report, actually you can report the wages online or you can do them. You can do that by your phone. There's an app for that. So if you go to our website, you can find out what the, what the, what the app is on, that you can put on your phone and you can report those wages or you can just phone them in. You can phone, phone in those wages uh, and, and you know, keep us. But you should, you should do a monthly reporting because wages can, uh, change from month to month. So if there's an increase in wages, uh, that means that the SSI check probably will will go down in subsequent months and if there's a decrease it will probably go up but if it should have gone down and it didn't and you didn't let us know in time then there's going to be an overpayment you're going to end up owing us money now let me just tell you this uh also when a child turns 18 uh dds makes a determination whether that child is capable or not capable meaning can they receive his or her checks in their own name Okay, so if the child is determined to be not capable, okay, then the person who was there, who was getting the checks previously, who was their payee, will continue to be. If they are determined to be capable, 
Social Security office will contact the person uh, to file a uh, to file to be their own payee. Okay. Now this is one. This is kind of like um, shaky because at 18, I don't know how many kids, whether they have a disability or not, are really capable of handling their own money, but uh, legally they are able to get the monies in their own name. Now, just because your child is capable and able to get money in his, in his or her own name doesn't mean they shouldn't be contributing to household expenses. Because if they help you pay uh, rent or mortgage and food and, and uh, utilities, that's gonna result in a higher SSI payment. If they don't do any of that, that's going to result in a lower SSI payment. So you might hold that over their heads if they decide, oh, well, this is my money and I don't have to give you anything. Well, fine. You let Social Security know and their check will be reduced accordingly because they're not paying anything toward household expenses. As it relates to the student earned income credit, so again, um, the Social Security Administration doesn't know if your, your student is a full-time student, and, and if you don't tell them they don't know, you've got to ask for this, this earned income um, credit. Once you mm -hmm. supply proof, you've got proof of enrollment, and you've, you've asked this to be applied to your case, how long does it take to essentially get applied and do they do it retroactive to the month that you ask for it if it takes a long time? Yeah, they would do it retroactive. Uh, as far as how long it takes, now with COVID, might be several weeks, okay? Um, I wish I could tell you it's going to be done tomorrow, but, uh, you know, uh, it, might, it might take uh, maybe a month or longer, okay? For that to be, for that to be, but you know, be persistent. Uh, call the office maybe a week or two later and say I reported that. Uh, can you give me some idea uh, of when? And if they tell you when, a certain date and it's passed, call again. Okay, it doesn't it doesn't hurt to call and and ask and find out. Okay, if you're applying for your child for SSI, the medical decision takes about three months. In some cases, it could be four. Now, there are some conditions which can speed up the process, but we're not going to talk about that today. We don't have the time. And another a presentation when we talk about the rules for applying for SSI or SSDI, we can talk about that, but we really don't have time today, unfortunately. Okay, so, so you can report wages through a My Social Security account, but, uh, and actually, if you are the payee for your child, you're not going to be open. You're not going to be able to open up a My Social Security account for that child, unfortunately. However, my understanding is, as a payee, you can report the wages for the child under your record, under your My Social Security record. So, if you have a My Social Security account, how do you set that up? Go to SocialSecurity.gov or SSA.gov. There on the home page, there's an icon, a square that says. Do you want to open up a My Social Security account? Click on that, open that up, and then you could report your child's wages through your My Social Security account, okay? Visiting the office, that's not possible right now. Mailing or faxing the information, yes, or calling the 800 number or and calling the local office. We've heard that faxing is more effective at this point because it's kind of an electronic process for the Social Security Administration as opposed to mail since there's limited people oh, yeah. in the offices. So I just wanted to put that out there that it may have been in the past that mailing was more effective and you could send it certified or whatever you wanted to, but lately faxing has been more effective. You agree with that? Good point, Allison. Yes, I definitely agree. Uh, sending it by fax rather rather than mail is definitely going to be uh, it's going to have a quicker turnaround time. And then we're getting some um, some some stuff in the chat box about these stimulus yeah. checks, and they they don't count. They against. don't count. They do not count. The stimulus check does not count. And and also tax refunds as well. Like they don't. They That's don't right. Count. That's they right. Because we already them. counted them when we already counted the gross income when we were doing the calculations. So we're not going to count it again. Here is the red book. We have the 2020 edition. I I don't think 2021 is out yet but I haven't checked in the past two weeks or so. So, but I think the 2020, I know the 2020 is out 
and that will tell you about the different programs that we have. Now, uh, let me go to some of the questions in the chat box here. Yes, I'm, I was just it. I was just getting ready to read. Are you okay. almost done with you your slide? Go? Okay, you, you can read. Yeah, them I'm going to read them to you. Okay. Um, one thing that um, one thing that we had somebody in the chat box um, talking about is the application process. There was a lot of medical questions um, out there. Maybe they don't know all the answers. Um, and um, and it's in the medical record. And some, you know, I want to kind of pick your brain on that. But some advice that we give is before you're applying, um, get your ducks in a row. Um, contact that primary care physician. Ask them what does the record look like, um, because sometimes there's mistakes in the medical record, and that could cause a delay or cause could cause you to get denied. Um, because there are mistakes that doesn't clearly paint the picture of what is truly the disability of your child. Um, so having the names, so being prepared is name, address, and phone numbers of the, uh, of the attending physicians that work with your child, dates of diagnosis, medications that they might be on. That's a little homework that you could have together. And honestly, it's good homework to have anyway um, for a future caregiver if something were to happen to you or you were incapacitated. Somebody else might need to know this information anyway. So that's my advice, you know, and that's coming from as a parent that applied for, for my child. Do you have some additional advice on that, Andy? Yes, if you're, if you're applying for SSI, what you can do is maybe after three or four weeks, you can call Social Security and ask them for the, the number of DDS of the person who's handling the medical portion of your claim. That the DDS folks are in Austin here for Texas. So they will, this way, you can be connected to the person who is, who is being contacted by your doctors, hospitals, uh, school districts, and you can ask them, do you have everything in file that you need? Because sometimes claims are denied because all that information is not available. So you want to you want to check back with DDS once in a while and see like if he says, well, we haven't gotten your uh, the information from from your child's doctor yet. You can call your child's doctor and say, look, I just contacted DDS. They told me they still haven't gotten the medical report from you. Can you tell me when that's going to be faxed over to them? So you can you know you can just be your best best advocate for your child. And of course, if your child's case is denied you have 60 days to file for a reconsideration. A reconsideration means that someone other than the person who originally denied the case is gonna look at the case and see if uh, maybe they can come up with another, another decision. If the reconsideration is denied, then you can request, you have 60 days to request a hearing. It'll go before an administrative law judge and you can either show up at the hearing, which now is not, it would be via video you know, uh, kind of like a live, live uh, thing where, where they would, they would actually see you and you would present the case to the hearing. At, at that point, a lot of people, a lot of people um, have a, an attorney at that point. You don't need one if, if, but if you want, uh, you could because the attorneys do their homework. They look at the blue book and they try to get as much evidence as they can that agrees with what's in the blue book. So the case can be approved, but that's up to you. And also, Andy, um, you've mentioned the red book, you've mentioned the blue book. Um, I found it val valuable to look at the blue book. Again, it's an impairment guide and it basically it lists a ton of different impairments and it tells you exactly what the Social Security Administration needs to prove disability, what they're looking for. You know, like if it's a neurological disorder, it's disorganization of multiple limbs. I mean, so it tells you what they're looking for. So you can you can see what they're looking for. You can re request a copy of your child's medical record to see if it's clear uh, that they have the inability to do those things. Those are, those are some things that you can do on the front end before you apply, and I think it's valuable. And you also, you can, if, you, if you go to ssa.gov, uh, you could also, in the search box up above, type in understanding SSI. The, the formal title is Understanding Supplemental Security Income. All you have to type in is Understanding SSI. And it's a book, 
It's about 100 pages long, but it's wonderful. It's a great resource that tells you all the rules and regulations of the SSI program. So even though, for instance, uh, you can only have $2,000, your child can only have $2,000 in a, in a total of their bank accounts, but they can have a, uh, an account for burial. They can have an ABLE account where they can have up to $100,000 in that, and that's not countable. Uh, they can have trust funds. There's all kinds of things. And that understanding SSI is a great book to have uh, maybe several months or a year before your child becomes eligible so you know what the rules are. We've got a question out there, and I'm not, I, don't, I don't know anything about this one. Um, is there still an opportunity for a subsidy that accounts for the lesser productivity percentage for a disabled employee? Absolutely. We did not cover that today, but let's say, let's say your child is earning $1,000 a month. Uh, he was employed by a neighbor who has his business, and he saw that your child, you know, is eager to work, and... Um, so, so your child goes to work in a warehouse where there are other young people. The other young people are earning $1,000 a month, as is your child. However, the, the owner, neighbor friend of yours, realizes that your child, the level of work that they provide maybe is not up to snuff of the others. So maybe the true worth of what your child is making is probably $700 a month rather than $1,000 a month. But he says, you know, I want to pay everybody the same. All right. That would be what we call a subsidy. So if you contact us and say, I think my child is making more money than what their work productivity is actually worth. We send the form to the employer and if he says yes i pay them a thousand dollars a month but the true worth of that is probably seven hundred dollars okay well that means that instead of counting the thousand we would count the 700 because the 300 the additional 300 is what we call a subsidy meaning that they're being paid uh for whatever reason but that's not really the value of their work the, so whatever is not the real value of their work uh would be subtracted from the gross income, and that means we wouldn't count that portion. That's a great question. Um, one person said that their SSI check was reduced due to starting work right away, even though they mailed proof. And I was reminded that um, by that question that also, so if you didn't know about the, stu the student earned income uh, exclusion, and so, so say your, your loved one's check was reduced because they were working and when you reported the working, the, um, the representative didn't talk to you anything about the exclusion, you can go back and, and submit that for that time work and they can go back and give you a credit. So yes. if you feel yes. like you missed out, they can fix it and you should go back and have them fix it, but you'll still need to have proof of that that full-time um, enrollment um, or based off of the numbers that Andy gave earlier. Right, because if you don't mention that when you first said they went to work, the only thing we're gonna do is take the gross income, subtract $85, divide by two, and that's gonna count against your SSI. But if there's subsidies involved or impairment related work expenses or whatever, we'll develop that, you know, uh, we'll take your allegation and then we'll ask you to submit proof of that. And then if it's approved, then, you know, whenever that started, we can go back and, uh, and then retroactively uh, apply that to, to the SSI. And then that might mean that we owe you money or your child money because we counted too much of their wages because there were these other things, these work incentives involved. Got it, got it. So let me see, I've got just a couple more and, I, and we're kind of at a wrap up point. Um, my child is 25 and just got enough credits to apply for SSDI. He has the HCS waiver. We do not want to lose Medicaid and thus losing HCS, which means you still have to follow the guidelines for SSI, basically. It, the, the, the guidelines and the, uh, the assets that, you know, the 2,000 if you're single, 3,000 if you're married, one house, one car, it still has to fall under that. So if you have more money, and, and you're figuring out what do I ha what do I do with this? This is where the able account or the special needs trust comes into play. So you've got to have other tools in your toolbox um, in order to not go over. Because basically, if you go over, you do you are at risk of, of losing that. Right. Um, 
is there still an opportunity uh, for a subsidy? Okay, we already got that one. Uh, and then the stimulus check, we also have that as well. So um, basically, again, the stimulus checks, tax refunds, all that kind of stuff is not going to count towards the assets um, of the individual on SSI. Uh, we could go all day on this topic, Andy, as usual. So um, I do get the red book. Do do read read about this. And again, just know that if you so if you are already as a parent, you're already retired or you're already disabled. Then, then your disabled adult child whose disability started prior to age 22, they're a DAC under your record, then they would be kind of a, they could be the, uh, the concurrent enrollment. And there's a, a lot of other hoops and loops and a lot of other things that you need to be aware of when, when they are dual eligible. So that's probably another conversation for another day. Um, but Andy, you always do a fantastic job we always have like really, really great questions out there. So um, we do have one last one I want to just put out there to clarify the wage reporting through the app. Um, what was the SSA 821 for? Can you, can you just talk That's about a, a that work one more time? Report that the SSA 821 says the name of the employer and it, it's to determine if there's anything, any factors that, that we could develop that meaning that we would count less of the wages. So, so, so anytime there is, there's work activity, use the SSA 821 as the work report to report what the wages are. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, well, Andy, thank you so much for being uh, with us. Andy, uh, uh, Veronica, I am gonna turn everything back over to you. Um, and thank you for having us. Patty, if you have more questions for Allison and Andy, please email us and we were happy to help you guys. Thank you so much for being today with us. Thank Bye. You See you in the next one. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>